The summer is over for Mead, Westmead, Cabin and Claire. After a weekend, we were treated to two TV thrillers. Hello and welcome to the Throwing Football Show. My name is Shane Brennan. Today I'm joined by Dick Clerken and Colin Keyes to break down some of the major talking points after the final round of round robin fixtures in the race for Sam Maguire. And lads, I'm going to kick straight into it because I think the biggest game or the one that definitely caught the most eyes was the matchup in Roscommon between Mayo and Dublin. And... I have to say, lads, I think this game was a real missed opportunity for Mayo. Watching back over, and even as I was watching it yesterday, I thought that those were there for the taking. And fair enough, they really had a, no a number of really big game changers who came off the bench, came up with a fantastic equalising score at the end. But I think as Mayo look at this, considering the matchups that they had, considering that the, the field they were on and the dubs kept slipping on, considering they saw a good chunk of the ball and they had the ball for a good chunk of time, I think this is a game that Mayo left behind them more than a game where uh, where Dublin really took a step back. Colm, you were there, you were watching it live. What was your take on that? Do you really think that people in Mayo might feel that this was a missed opportunity, really, to get uh, one over the Dubs? Well, beating Dublin is like trying to round the runner who has the inside lane going the la round the last bend on, on an indoor track. It is so hard to get past them that you might think, yes, Mayo should have won and a lost opportunity. But actually going doing it and getting that last point ahead of Dublin is always the most difficult aspect of playing them because they are masters of timing. They are masters of holding the nerve. And I think we saw one of the great points at the end of this game yesterday uh, for Dublin to dig out an equaliser in a game that you would say, you know, they don't really have to win it, but Dublin never think like never think like that. Yes, you can point to missed opportunities for Mayo, especially in the first half. I felt they left a good bit behind, but also Dublin did too. Dublin were not as clinical in their pursuit of goals as I felt they normally would be. So yes, a missed opportunity, but you have to factor in the quality of that last point uh, it's as good 10 seconds of play that Dublin have produced in a long, long time. And I think ultimately we'll be looking back at this moment and saying mm, that's where the season perhaps has pivoted because had they gone into uh, an extra game, put them on the same side, then perhaps as Kerry in the in the quarter final, so many different permutations, so many to things, things to come out of it. But that moment really encapsulated so much of this Dublin team and their predecessors. But notwithstanding all that, very competitive. And I think it'll serve Mayo well too. It really is the fine margins of the championship. And you mentioned that point there. Everything about it was as exquisite from the kick out from Stephen Cluxon, the catch by Kieran Kilkenny and Jack McCaffrey, who was a real impact player. He came on, I think, for 20 minutes from the end and just had a fantastic game for the Dubs. But... It shows to me, I think, the importance of when you're playing against Dublin, who traditionally have always been a bit of a second half team, that when you have the chances in the first half, you have to take them. And I think that's where Mayo really took a bit of a step back, because as much as Dublin have the game changers and as much as they know when to turn it on, as they did for that final point, which they hadn't scored for the previous 10 minutes, we have to remember as well. So they turned it on when they needed to. But when we look at the game overall, it was a great match to, to watch. Obviously, ended up 17 points apiece. I mean, they must have spent half the game uh, tied up. Rarely was there more than two points in it. I think there was a few chances that Mayo really had in the first half to properly get a bit of a lead and to maybe put a bit more air into the ball here. And I just don't think that some of their conservative play, they were passing around, not going for shots, maybe trying to organise an opening, which didn't really work against the Dublin defence because the Dublin defence is too good for that kind of stuff. But it was only after when they went for it that they really got some, I, I believe, some kind of return out of it. So, from the Mayo point of view, I think if they if they went for it, they might have really had a, a chance of, of getting one over. But then then again, the more you push the dubs, the more they push back and the more they come up with fantastic scores like they did at the end of the game. Dick, I don't know what your view is on that. I think both sides really showed the top quality they, uh, they have. But again, missed opportunity for, for Mayo, I think. Ah, it isn't, it isn't. It's like when you're, when you're at that level, Shane... <sighs> The fine margins, are, when you're when you're benchmarking yourself and competing at that level, like there's so many instances in the game, and it's very easy for us to to look and pick out a couple of couple of missed opportunities and different things. Rarely is going into that game, we all would have felt maybe Mayo were probably on balance four or five points. Bookies probably had that going, and that was the, that was the gap. All things been equal, Mayo were leaving that game yet yeah, disappointed, and you can see that in their faces. But I'd say that would be a 
a fairly good Mayo dressing room and a, a fairly good training week for Mayo this week because why do they think, right, we're, we're a lot closer now to being able to compete for an All-Ireland final that we might have thought prior to that game because they hadn't really given us enough to sort of really think that they're still within touch and distance of Dublin. We all felt, again, based on what we've seen thus far this year, that now they're they're really back in the race. And that's, I sort of made reference in, in, in my column last week that this weekend for me was about who from that pack can come out of the weekend further down the line or enhance their their, their chances of winning in All-Ireland. And I think in that respect, Mayo did that. They didn't get the result. They could have beat Dublin. But if you're going to beat Dublin, don't beat them in a, a round robin qualifier. Beat them in an All Ireland semi final or beat them in a final. So what Mayo have now is the confidence that they can go all the way. If they can push Dublin all the way, they can beat anybody else over the next couple of weeks, and they'll not fear Dublin again. They'll have got confidence in players like Aidan O'Shea, big performance. Again, okay, light on the scoreboard, but contributed a lot. People have been questioning, is he still is he still relevant? Is it, does he still have a place on that Mayo team? He very much does. Tommy Conroy, who has sort of come and gone over the last couple of years, he's almost like a new forward for Kevin McStay, such as the impact. So they should be really, really buoyed and really, really confident. They got a good draw, I think in Derry because it's a name, it's a scalp, but based on what we're seeing, oh, Derry something that Mayo should be should be should be beaten. Um, so I think Mayo, yeah, great credit to them. They fronted up as they've always done, and like how few other counties do against Dublin, they fronted up and created a great contest. Just fell short, but as Colin said, gained an awful lot of credit in the process. That's a good point you make there, Dick. That um. It- there is a time to beat Dublin and maybe the round robin isn't really the time and Mayo are coming were quite obvious that they targeted this game that they were going to give it their all watching Kevin McStay uh, talk afterwards it was quite clear that he was incensed with, at the, the chat that maybe Mayo mightn't give it their all he wanted to let the world know that they gave everything they had into this game and tried to, to, to put it up to Dublin and from that I think they will be taking some uh, some good feedback and some good feeling heading into what is, again, a slightly more difficult run into the All-Ireland uh, semi-finals and so on that you know may have often taken the scenic route to have to take it again a little bit, facing against uh, Derry this coming weekend. But Colin, when you were talk- chatting to the managers, like, do you really feel that Kevin McStay is probably the happier of the two with that performance? The fact that, that, they, that they showed the matchups, that they put it up in a way that you know, a few other teams have against Dublin, tested themselves, tested Dublin, and surely taking a lot to learn to bring ahead to what is going to be another tough game against Derry. I think Kevin McStay should be happy with the performance and obviously not so much the result because, you know, they they may have defended that last. Although, I, you know, there's a lot of talk around Mayo. Why didn't they pull somebody down? Try pulling Jack McCaffrey down when he's going through a gap. He was clear of everybody. Try you know, disrupt Kieran Kilkenny when he's soaring that high to uh, to catch like that. He had the mark anyway. He released it to Jack McCaffrey, who's gone, and just it was so clinical. So I don't really think that's an argument that they didn't defend it properly at the end. Maybe get a touch. Having said that, that's the most competitive they have been, notwithstanding that they probably should have held on in the Connacht final as well. So that's a couple that in the in the closing stages that have, have drifted away from them. But Dublin are the benchmark. Uh, Mayo got an awful lot right yesterday. David McBride picked up Conor Callaghan, held him, scored us. David McBride is a really, really good footballer. He's a good man marker. He's also very good to come forward as well. So he brings he brings a lot to them. Uh, and Dick mentioned Aidan O'Shea. Aidan O'Shea had a very influential role. He won a lot of frees, a lot of assists. And <clears> for <throat> once he took the ball into contact against Dublin and was able to recycle it. They weren't able to get round him. And that's a very significant, that can be very significant uh, victories for Dublin to, to pin Aidan O'Shea as they do. And then Tommy Conroy and Rhino Donahue, Matthew Ryan, were able to break free into space, get one-on-ones. And Dublin don't usually allow their players to be... Uh, to be exposed to one-on-one. So there'll be a collective defensive issue there that I think Desi Farrell will be looking at. They're missing Keen Murphy. They're missing Lee Gannon. I thought Mick Fitzsimons was a little bit exposed at times yesterday too. So there'll be aspects for Desi Farrell that he won't be happy with. So I would think to answer your question, Kevin McStay, probably happier because he realises and Mayo realise now 
we're not too far off the pace here. Obviously, Croke Park and in a knockout game, much different scenario. And that's where Dublin really, really major. But I think Mayo can still go forward with a lot of confidence. They have a home game against Derry. It's the toughest draw. I'm not so sure it's the draw they would have wanted, but it's the one they have now because Derry could be the wounded animal. They could be like Derry were coming into the 2009 All-Ireland quarterfinal against Dublin. Sometimes something can spark, although I'm not so sure that there is a spark left in this Derry team uh, just yet. They really look to be off and look to be off on Saturday, Saturday night too. So yes, that should be a good dra Mayo dressing room. Uh, this week, I think they have a lot to look forward to, and they really know what their what their strengths are now in who to, in terms of who to match up with who. Yeah, that's a good point you make about Derry, who of course are coming off uh, beating Westmead. We, we were we were talking about this last week, Dick. You just said that all Mickey Hart needed was a win. He got the win, and we know that in sport, a lot of it is what have you done for me lately. And as much as Derry have been strong throughout much of this league, they came against against the Westmead team where look they got the win, but they didn't. They didn't blow the lights out or anything like that. They're coming against a much tougher test against Mayo this weekend. So what do you expect to come from them? Do you think that you were saying last week that the Derry players in particular need to own the slide and find something within themselves to, I guess, reawaken to go further into the championship? There's a great opportunity there for this game against Mayo for them to do that. I'm just not quite sure whether they, whether they're, they're ready to really kickstart themselves back in the way they had beforehand. When you're watching that, uh, that Derry game. What way did you did you take? Yeah, yeah. Like they weren't overly impressive. They, they needed to win to stay in the race. That's the first the first thing they needed to survive because that as that as that game went on, that wasn't guaranteed, and you just felt that they they just just about had enough to get them over the line. I suppose the next step then was in terms of who are they going to draw. You know, if the if 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 the if the, the air gets a wee bit thin with the next round, that might take them out. And I think now they're going to Castle Bar, playing a buoyant Mayo. You'd expect a big crowd. The Mayo crowd will be back out in full force. They're starting to believe again. God help us. And Mayo, that they might just find that, um, or Derry might just find that a bit much because you, you just get the sense that they're just not at the the pace or the level that they need to be. Because you know, Mayo's or Derry's strength was always the collective, you know, the collective energy, the collective structure in terms of defence and attack, and and how they were set out. And that just doesn't seem to be running as fluid. So it it really just depends what Derry. Like we're, we're hearing rumours. We don't need to get in, get into all of that. We just don't know all we can base it on what we see in terms of the performance where we're at. So. They're still, they still didn't give any sense that they're they're back up to the level that that we thought they were uh, five or six weeks ago. They beat a Westmeath team that they should have been beaten, all things been equal, and they got little little much else out of it. Um, so a bit of confidence, it'll it'll sort of give Mickey Hart and he give some of the players there a wee bit of breathing space. Kier McFall put in a big show. I think he got man of the match, did he? Because again, any any reference to him was all in the negative in the week leading up in terms of his ill discipline. So you know, players will get confidence confidence from that there's more positivity than what was the, what they were having to listen to I think now if Mayo were any good they should be able to put them away and, and I think the fact that yes it's a it's a it's a week less but for a team like Mayo or anybody that's going through that last 12 there is equally the opportunity to to build momentum, and we'll we'll talk about Galway in a minute. That I think, and again, not to be unfair to my own county, you know, they have a draw now. Yes, it's a week less, but they can they can build momentum. They can get confidence that they can then bring through and get players back in form, back, players who might have been injured, getting them game time. And I think I, I didn't get any sense, obviously, Paddy Dorkin. I didn't hear any of any injuries or any concerns from from the Mayo camp. More so, actually, players were coming in. Um, yeah, young Loftus came in. He had a big performance in the second half. Who had me? So I, I, I think Mayo came out of that game an awful lot stronger in terms of their panel and depth than they went into it. That was that was my sense of it. Um, and I think that'll that'll definitely stand to them as as the weeks ahead. It's interesting, Dick, that you you know you mentioned Mayo should be able to take care of business against Derry in Castlebar this weekend. Three months ago, I was down at the league match between the two teams, and it was yeah. the exact opposite feeling. Yeah. I mean, Derry. Won that game quite comfortably. Mayo came back late at them. Came at them. Came at them late. Now, obviously, they were on different pathways at the time. Mayo were just trying to see out the league in a comfortable position. Derry were really they were gunning for a final. But it just shows you how much things flip in three months. Obviously, two different competitions, different circumstances. But Derry were really comfortable that day, and I thought it was a sign. 
Uh, obviously, we all took it as a sign and they went on to to, to win the league, albeit after penalties. But you t- I took that Mayo game as a sign of real Derry maturity and that they, they have arrived at the team that, uh, as a team that they could go to McHale yeah. Park and win with that bit of control and comfort. And yeah. here we are three months later and what you've said is all true. Mayo should take care of business yeah. on form. Yeah, but it, we just don't know. I suppose you don't know what Derry teams coming down the road, which you know. So we know their their ceiling in terms of that early league form against Mayo and and the league final, and we know their floor. How far up from that have they got? We just don't know. We'll just have to wait and see in terms of how how hungry are they, how fresh are they? Like, is their fatigue kicking in? Is it just whatever? But in the head that the legs have sort of letting are letting some of those players down who have put in a very hard shift over the winter and the years previous. We don't know. Because that, that's what we're seeing play out over the last few weeks. So can Mickey Hart get the boys and up at, another step up? Looking at Shane McGuigan and Paul Cassidy, really good kickers of the ball yeah. as they were much earlier in the season and last year as well. And obviously McGuigan's case the year the year before. But their form and their accuracy has really has really waned. And even even as Derry were winning against Westmead at the last day in the second half, some of the shots. So that's that's a real confidence issue. Yeah. But Teams can teams can click. If Derry got ahead and they got, you know, they've Connor McCluskey oh. there scoring a goal again. Yeah. They get out ahead. That poses a completely different uh, challenge yeah. for Mayo. I'm just going to move it on to uh, across Connacht when Galway played against Armagh. I just really, when I was looking at this game, I don't know whether to look at it as uh, Armagh snatching victory from, from a defeat. Now, I know it was a draw in the end, but to all intents and purposes, it was a victory for Armagh. And that's the way they celebrated after the game, considering they were five points down at one point. A draw was good enough for them to top the group and for Galway to be put in to the preliminary quarterfinals. I don't know whether, as I was saying, whether Armagh snatched victory from the jaws of defeat or whether uh, Galway sort of snatched defeat from the jaws of victory because they put themselves under a lot of pressure with some of those kickouts, letting in a goal and a point which really helped turn the game late, late on into that game. So, Colin, when you're looking at kind of the way that Galway really managed that match against a team where they have had a lot of close, close encounters with in the last couple of seasons, do you think that as much as Galway have been missing a couple of their star players and need a couple of things to go right, this is a game where they were in control and somehow lost control of it. All credit to Armagh for, for getting the result and fair play to them, but I think Galway might question themselves for putting themselves under too much pressure near the end there. Uh, yeah, they have a great rivalry over the last three years. It's nearly nearly the best rivalry in the game right now. If you look at the, the outcomes, there's uh, over over three games and you include extra time in 2022 that there's just a point between them and that was that was last year obviously with a late free and then a missed free a missed opportunity from Shane Walsh to 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 equalize so there is a great rivalry there there's never there hasn't been too much between them but ironically there was quite a bit between them around the 50th minute when when Galway went five points up with a wind and left chances behind. Shane Walsh dropped one short there was another one went across the goals I just felt that Galway really could have turned the screw and should have turned the screw. And obviously, Armagh were able to break and win. I think it was their first scoreable free from it, from inside, which they converted. And then from the kick out, short kick out and a goal. And that changed the dynamic completely. It, it tightened up again. Um, so I think a lost, a real lost opportunity for Galway. They had control of that game. Any team of their quality would expect with the wind five points up to be able to see out a game like that. So Armagh came back, yes, and engineered a brilliant uh, late score, a little bit like Dublin, maybe not just as as dynamic and swift, but still had the nerve to get through, get the draw. Galway, yeah, that's a, that's not a bad draw for Galway at home against Monaghan. Uh, it'll give them another week to see where Damien Comer is. Damien Comer is so pivotal to them. Uh, I would have thought that earlier in the year that, you know, even during the championship when he came back and he produced that performance against Mayo, they they really need him. So to get a draw with Armagh without Comer, maybe without Sean Kelly, who's been playing centre forward, and he just hasn't been the dynamic Sean Kelly of the last couple of seasons either. He's their captain, but he just hasn't been making those openings. I thought Shane Walsh played well yesterday. I thought he showed a lot of control. He made good decisions on the ball, albeit he didn't always get the run on the Armagh defence. Armagh will defend very deep and defend very well collectively and try to hit a team on the break. So opportunities weren't always there. So 
a little bit like a little bit maybe less so than Mayo. Obviously, they weren't playing Dublin, but I think Galway will take a lot from it. I think at home they'll be they'll be a very difficult team next weekend to beat, and I think they will make all Ireland quarterfinals. Very much depends now where is Damien Comer with his injury. Uh, Dick, just as a as someone who has spent time in in intercounty dressing rooms, I just want to. Uh, Get your view on Armagh spending what, 20 minutes inside the dressing room at half time. The officials had to come and take them out of it. I'm not quite sure what was happening there. Do you reckon that's, do you reckon that's a bit of gamesmanship going on there? That's just, they just lost track of time. What, what, what do you think was happening there in the Armagh dressing room? Oh, I don't know. I didn't realise that I was only picking up bits of the coverage because I was I was over in, in Brefney at the, at the Monaghan game, so I, I wasn't privy to that. I don't know. Ah, listen, sometimes something's happened. Somebody needs a wee bit of treatment or they do lose a run of time or, you know, maybe <laughs> A few too many people need to need yep. to hear their own hear their own the voices. Thing about it is, Dick, uh, one of the one of the match officials had to go in twice. Yeah, twice. To, yeah, that's uh, not good. That's to, not good. To, that's to get not them good. out. So yeah, Galway yeah. were, were waiting on the pitch. So uh, you know, it's you have fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes should be long enough for for yeah, for any team. Be. It should be. It and should be. the only the only thing I would say about that is obviously the penalties for this are not strong enough because otherwise, if the penalties were strong enough, they wouldn't do it. They'd be back out. No. Or ready and in time for fifteen minutes. So. Yeah, COVID. Remember when COVID? There was teams didn't come out through the water break. There were scenes of the ball been thrown in and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I can't answer. I don't know if, if McGinney was pressed on it afterwards. Did he get? Did anyone get a good answer forward? It's poor. It'd be poor form if it was gamesmanship. Like we're beyond that. Jesus, we need to grow up a wee bit. I was so giving giving them the benefit of the doubt that something maybe went on. Some player needed a wee bit of treatment. But as you say, when they were asked a couple of times, there's no really. Well, when you're asked a couple. Of times and maybe the yeah. facility is there for a referee to start the game. Teams will come out within reason, within yeah. reason. But I think I do think it is something. I won't say it's insulting to the other, to the other, to 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 their opponents or anything like yeah. that. But the, you know there is there are times there for to to observe and just just get on with it. Yeah, well, and Arma don't like I've been hard on Arma over the years because at different times needless silly stuff like that and even sometimes McGinney's antics on on the pitch afterwards. I know there's a time after the Monaghan game. You, you don't need that, you know. If you if you wanna if you wanna be at the top table with the the Dublin's and the Kerry's and and those teams competing winning all Ireland's, there is a there is a standard that you, you need to meet in terms of your your uh, your how would you say your bedside manner. So listen, I'd be disappointed now if they were at that carry on. They don't need to be because I think they're now rightfully in terms of credit earned as opposed to people giving them um, credit before it was due. They, they rightfully can be up there now and looking forward with real real ambition this year because I think so, they'll I think they'll take a lot from you know. Yeah salvaging the draw they certainly weren't yeah, as absolutely. good as they were against Derry they were really good against Derry but they dug out a result they took the opportunity that came to them and they will bounce into an All-Ireland quarterfinal you know in the knowledge that last year they really they they were really conservative and cautious and left yeah. that game out there for long enough to, from, from on and obviously to come and get a draw after extra time I think you'll see a different Arma approach I think they'll be more buoyant more more conscious of getting forward quicker. They are a very, very fast counter-attacking team. And the other noticeable feature about the performance against Galway was how they could put the squeeze on an opposition kick out as they did against Derry. It's something, it's two aspects of their game, yeah. the counter-attack and how they pressure yeah. an opposition kick out as well. Two yeah. things that they do really well. A couple of players going very well from Connor Turbot has yeah. really impressed me this year. And there was three quality points from Rian O'Neill really? at different yeah, stages. He, yeah, so really, he has that in his, really in his, in his toolbox, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So they've, they've, they've a lot going for them, albeit I thought they should have yeah, go away, go away really around the 50, 50 to 55 minute mark. I thought Galway should have probably, probably finished them. But Armagh hung in and that's a good sign too, as much as the the performance and the you know the the ruthlessness of the performance against Derry, they were able to hang in and, and scramble a result out of uh, out of Sligo, which has put them in a really strong position too. Yeah. They won't and be a team that anyone will want to meet. No, they won't. And I suppose as well, Colm, no more so than than Mayo. I think I think both teams will will have come out of that game with enhanced reputations for the for the All Ireland conversation, which again I was making reference to. Because at like Galway, yeah, they'd be disappointed. Listen, they got a good draw, and I hate to say that as a Monaghan, it, it, in terms of they'll not mightn't have to even risk Damien Comer. They'll get maybe another week's 
uh, prepping him. And, you know, they got Killian McDade back. It'll give him another game. Like he looked, I, I, the wee bit I got, he, he got a, he's not around long enough to sort of say a vintage McDade point, but he, he got a point in the first half. He, he won the ball, strong running, came off the shoulder and just buried it over the bar. Like, no more so than 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 Mayo finding form with the likes of Tommy Conroy. There's a there's a player who 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 goalie effectively haven't had, and now he's starting to come into to form, and he just needs reps, he needs minutes, and the Monaghan game will give him another game to get up and running. And so I think I think Gal were in a good place. I think they were by far the better team. Um, they they probably left it behind them, but obviously with the mistakes, but they need to learn from that. That like the the, the, the goalkeeper Gleason, he has a weak kick out, and they need to protect that. And no more than if you're coaching. <laughs> I have a underage team, and I keep talking about the simple things like know what kickouts to not not to do. You know, he's a weak kick out, pull it to the left. He doesn't have a, you know, you see some kicks like Cluxton that goes straight and hard and fast to the player. It sort of it's, it sort of pulls and and it's a slow kick. He, he needs to protect that and know, you know, if it's not on, just step back and pick a target sixty yards down the pitch. You know, and they, they have a lot of targets because I don't know is there a bigger half no forward line That's in the right. game right. uh, certainly Matthew Tierney right. uh, now John Maher played midfield so but he, he was wearing 11 he yeah. played midfield Sean Kelly was in there but you have John Maher in around that area of Matthew Tierney and you had Keen yeah. Darcy the other side which are all well over you know they're all 6-2 they're yeah. all 6-2 upwards and obviously Paul Conroy as well who's having such a such an Indian summer to his career it really is he's been he's been terrific uh, yeah. this year uh, against against Derry and again yes they kicked two fine points yeah. uh, so you'd wonder why they don't go for that long option on the likes of Tierney Maher Maher is a player really impressing me his work rate his, his link play he's always his industry he's always trying to get forward he's always trying to make a pass and go and the other player you know we talk about Walsh and Comer and McDade Kelly a lot about it with Galway but Dylan McHugh another player who really mm. makes them. The he gets them 30, 40 metres with a run almost all the time. He'll make that decision cut infield. So they, they've, they've other elements to the game apart from those better better known players that, that we talk about a lot. There are so many other elements going well, but the kick out, kick out's an issue, cost them yesterday, yeah. cost them a, yeah. a goal and a point late on to put a lot of pressure on them and they gave up that advantageous advantageous position uh, as yeah. a consequence. But the only thing is they're trending in the right, you get to, if they get to a quarter final, semi-final stage, like you see even Mayo, Dublin, Kerry, Donegal, like the, the trend has gone to now to, to push up on kick outs and force the kick out long. Mm. So, you know, there's going to be more contested kick outs around the middle. So, it's not necessarily a thing that they might have a disadvantage of if they have to kick because they probably have no choice either. You know, he's not good enough to to pick out the the, the very tight short kickouts that a Cluxton or some of the, the Rory Began can. So I think a lot of teams now they're going to be reliant on their big players around the midfield to wee bit of traditional, you know, fifty fifty ball um, and fight for it. So I think. Galway are strong in that area so it, it, it shouldn't be a weakness that's what, what my point is trying to make they shouldn't be putting in those dodgy short kickouts because they have a strength out the field that they can compete or should can compete with the best uh, midfields out there in terms of you know physical size and, 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 and field ability Yeah I'm just going to move it on now to, uh, yeah. to to talk about Kerry for a second now I'll, I'll touch on this briefly because they I think they defeated Loud 221 to 110 it was as we or as was predicted last week a fairly strong performance by Kerry and a, and a big score but if we're being a bit picky with the Kerry defences I think we kind of have to be and I think some people in, some Kerry supporters are just, just naturally considering that they haven't really been tested in the way that Dublin let's say have been tested so far in this championship if we're being a little bit picky I think there was a couple of goal chances there for Loud that, that it was against a different team that was more clinical Kerry let himself more open now in fairness on the Sunday game on Sunday night um, Tomas Shea said look the way that Kerry play against some of these counties that leave themselves more open at the back so they can push up and play offensive football against a, uh, a team who maybe pose a greater offensive threat or in those closer games they won't leave as many gaps in the back and leave as many goal chances open for them but I don't know what, what you guys think I'll throw it over to you Colin first whether whether there is a weakness in, in Kerry that in, not necessarily in their overall defensive play but in just being open for, for goal chances because I think there was two or three really good chances that if it were another team other than Loud, you know, Kerry would have conceded a lot more goals there on Sunday. Well, one of the players who missed uh, the goal, the goal chance you talk about, Craig Lennon has scored four already this year, I think it was. So it was unusual for him to miss. He has been quite clinical. Uh, yes, there probably, there probably is a little bit about that. 
But then you look at Brino Beglig in the last two games. He scored six points now. I think three and three, pretty sure. Tom O'Sullivan, Kerry like to get forward. Gavin White, all these players will press forward. They will push up higher. When Kerry won the All-Ireland in 2022, they had Tyg Morley sitting back in a very, very deep role. Um, not so much now. Uh, they've sort of moved away a little bit from that. Uh, I would say Jason Foley, after a couple of injuries, still probably trying to find his way back into a bit of better form. But I wouldn't be overly concerned about it. I have to say, I think Kerry are doing, maintaining themselves pretty well, given the, the quality of opponents they've faced. Obviously, Monaghan, Mead and Louth are not at that level, say, that Dublin had against Mayo or what Galway and Armagh had between them either. So uh, I think they're maintaining themselves pretty well for a team that isn't going to really have a test, but I think it will stand to them, depending on obviously who they who they get in the quarterfinal. Uh, but I think it will stand to them. Yes, they don't have... Foley is their obvious man marker. Tom O'Sullivan will always do, will always do uh, a decent job uh, against an opponent too. Collectively, they need Morley sitting in that pocket. He does that so well. So maybe they revert to that now that they, the level of opponent they're facing uh, comes up a bit. But everything Kerry have done so far, they've done pretty much as, as they've expected as they've expected, as we've expected them to do, uh, they've maintained themselves very well. Whether it cost them the absence of a really, really, you know, a really competitive game through this series, uh, they had one against Mayo last year, and obviously they were able to turn things around and a competitive game against Cork. Um, but I think they're going into the quarterfinals now uh, in a pretty good state. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, in terms of how Kerry have really maintained the talent that they have, and they have. Obviously, quite a good abund uh, abundance of talent. They are one of the, the the front runners, as they almost always are, coming into the the final stretch of the season. So, Dick, you know, when we talk about the, these kind of top tier teams, do we put too much emphasis on whether they've been tested? Because as much as we carry, probably haven't been tested so far in this championship. There's nothing saying that no matter who they come against later on in the season, that they can't put out all the stops and really put in a strong performance against them. Maybe we, we maybe we are guilty a little bit too much of almost asking for more tests of teams when, in fact, what they really need to be doing is keeping what they have in reserve for when it really matters. <sighs> I think it's been the case with Kerry all year. They can only beat what's in front of them. I think, I think yourself was trying to make a case of them last week, Shane, that, that Louth could run them close. And I, I sort of I didn't think that was going to be the case. I thought, you know, a 10-point at least uh, victory was going to be there. And that's and that's how it played out. They were always just that too, too, too much better than Louth, who at the same time have proven themselves to be very competitive, no more so against Dublin. So... You know, it depends what if you want to if you want to size it up as as a maths equation. You know, if 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 Louth went and ran Dublin to what was it four three or four or five points in the Leinster in the Leinster final, but yet Kerry can can do them for what seventeen points. Well, where does this place Kerry then? You know, we don't know because you know how much belief had Louth going down the road yesterday. They competed well, but they were always you know comfortably second best. I think Kerry are, are there with Dublin, you know. There's, there's, but we we just don't know how how good or bad or or how strong they are in in the key areas in terms of midfield. I still think there's a question mark around their midfield, and that might be a bit unfair because they're they're, they're doing as well as they, they need at the minute. But they're, they're going to be coming up against at some stage. We've already talked about the likes of Armagh, Galway. We know about Dublin, um, even even Donegal, like strong, powerful midfields that. You know, if you're not getting a foothold, like essentially cost them in the All Ireland final last year. If you're not getting a foothold of primary possession, doesn't matter how many Cliffords you have up front. If you can't get them ball, you don't get the benefit out of having that strength. So, listen, I think the the we've been very unfair trying to constantly mark them down. All they can do is beat what's in front of them. They're doing it very well. They're doing it very efficiently. Um, players are are finding form. You know, I'm looking at Paul Murphy. You know, a player that probably should be starting to phase out. He's looking fit and fresh and and contribute because he's, he's a really good player for Kerry. I think he's one of these key players that was pivotal for the Royal Ireland successes in terms of his, you know, decision making and, 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 and you know, game smarts. Clifford, wee bit more. We've seen a wee bit more from him yesterday because he, he has been sort of labouring a wee bit. So I think they're they're just trending like other teams we've talked about. They're trending in the right direction. But listen, they're going to get a big game soon and then we'll know more. So I think we, we can't be marking them down just to, to make a case against them. They're doing what they, they need. They're, they're, they're relatively injury-free, I think. Um, they're, they're 
performing well and you know they're just taking care of business quite quite comfortably yeah no that's a fair point and uh, I'm going to move on to to the draw now for the preliminary quarterfinals we mentioned earlier that Mayo will host Derry Loud will host Cork Tyrone will host Roscommon and then Galway will host Monaghan and in fairness to, to Monaghan uh, they face a bit of a challenge uh, against Mead it, near the end of the game Mead end up uh, had to kind of chase the game it ended up being a three uh, point win for Monaghan so Dick, after watching the uh, that game, do you, is relief the word for for Monaghan, or is is a bit of confidence starting to to creep in there as well against what will be a difficult game against Galway this weekend? Yeah, I had as a as a, a very uneasy, queasy feeling for the most of the day yesterday, starting by going going to the Monaghan game, not really knowing to to what to expect. Then as the game sort of played out, you had no real confidence even when they went ahead next thing to tuck the foot off the gas so and then had to watch Rory McIlroy last night so you just uh, that's just where Monaghan's at at the minute like they, they they got a win and you know they played really well for about oh, the first five minutes and then ten minutes after the second half and and they definitely showed when they play well and play off the front foot play with a bit of energy they, they can compete they just haven't done that for enough games. I'm not sure if it's in them to do it. I just think, listen, I'd be, I wouldn't be doing my job as a, as a, as a pundit or analysis or whatever you want to call it to try and say that they're going down with 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 a fighting chance against Galway with anything more than hope, and that would be rose tinted glasses because they should have been beaten. Like that's not a good Meath team by any stretch. Like they were very very poor. They sort of Monaghan let them back into the game, and you know they should have been out of sight. And it's a pity Monaghan only had to win that game by another four points, and they would actually finish second. In the league, as we were actually really annoyed coming off the terraces, that you know, did Monaghan not know that because they were nine points up? They've had to close that game out. They'd had a home draw this weekend instead of now we have to go down to Galway. How many Gal- How many Monaghan fans will make the trip down knowing that the team's just not at the level to really beat that Galway team? And again, I don't want to be pessimistic, it's not fair, but just there's an obvious gap in terms of standard where that Monaghan. Uh, me game yesterday by comparison to anything else that was probably played out and that's just that's just the word but but listen credit them getting the results they could have easily lost that game um if they hadn't got in and they fought well and they you know they, 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 they were the better team but listen I think let's be honest Galway would have been quite happy with the draw this morning that's that's the reality of it yeah and I just look across the the other side of the pitch to me and look they're they're an unusual situation I look at a lot of clubs that say in English soccer where there's a, so, there's a few clubs that seem to oscillate between being re- relegation level Premier League teams and going for promotion in the championship. And I look at Meath now, obviously coming into this after winning the Talton Cup, did not have a very good Sam Maguire uh, campaign. Obviously, it's depending on, on, on league results next year as to whether they will be in the Talton Cup in future. But you, you can just tell they're, they're occupying a weird space in between where they're not good enough to really compete in a lot of these Sam Maguire level games. But yet, if they were to play in the Talton Cup, they would be one of certainly one of the stronger teams. Is that the future now for for me, Column? That they're kind of inhabiting that weird kind of grey area between the top tier and the second tier. That they're never they're either too good or not or or not good enough to to compete in, in there. Because I think for a big county like me, and we've talked about this before on the show. There's no reason for them to have put up a stronger challenge earlier in the game against Monaghan against the other teams in their group in uh, the, the Leinster Championship as well. There, there's no reason why they can't, after winning the Tottenham Cup, they can't take another step forward again. The problem is they just haven't done it. Yeah, it's been a very, very poor year for me. There's no no getting away from very poor championship uh, for, from me. The very passive, they're not taking a lot of boxes. Tactically, they're not taking them. Physically, they're not taking them. Even the, I've spoken about this before. There isn't any pace. There isn't any player apart from maybe... Matthew Costello that's really, really going to hurt opponents by running at them. So that's a real deficit. Um, obviously, uh, conceding a lot of goals, three goals against Longford, three more against Dublin, three more against Louth, two against Kerry, another one another one yesterday. The league wasn't even great. Uh, the league wasn't great either. They survived, but they survived because chiefly because they beat a Gildare team that was missing their two best players in the second half that afternoon and Kildare left chances out there. So, yes, that's where me there and I think that's where they will be, but they still should be better and there still should be more 
got out of this team than what they're currently showing because to lose by 10 points to Loud, obviously there were nine down against Monaghan. Yes, they are young, but then Monaghan are young too. I looked at the Monaghan team, you think oh, that's an old yeah. Monaghan team. It's not. There's a lot it's of not. young young players, young fast players. There's a bit of pace in Monaghan. They don't have that physical edge that they might have had before. But I guarantee if you're to calculate the average ages of the two teams yesterday, there wouldn't be a whole lot of difference. In fact, Meath could even be a little bit ahead. Uh, so... You know, they're not they're not in a in a good place. The Tolson Cup is a bit of an illusion, really. And I think other teams will find out. Mind you, Westmead have kicked on from there. Westmead have been very, very competitive in Sam Maguire over the last two years. And that's something that Mead should be aiming towards, that level of competitiveness, but it hasn't been there. Just because every competition, like Champions League, Premier League, anything we watch, there's always some teams any given year that are at the bottom but for different reasons. And you can't just change the competition and carve them out. You have to give, that's part of any any sort of top tier competition. You have to give teams that are in that middle ground, the platform or the up the opportunity to progress, like Colin has referenced as 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 a Westmeath. Um me didn't seem to use it that well this year. But who's to say down next year who showed a lot of promise in the Ulster Championship, they could come through the Chelsea Cup, that they won't be the next West Mead. I think we have to allow that and just because there will be mismatches, there's mismatches in every competition. We've separated out that there's less of them. So we don't have to look at you know complete obvious ones. But you know, I, I think I think Meath probably they would be very disappointed with themselves. It's not it's not the structures fault. Meath should have been able to compete with Louth and they never realise how beatable that Monaghan team was. Like as you say, Colin, there's a lot of young, inexperienced players not playing senior football, even in Monaghan Club football, that Monaghan still were able to be comprehensively better than them from. So that was a very beatable Monaghan. So there's no excuses for me. They were at the level that they should have been able to compete and they just didn't take it. And and for sure they should be a lot better in the games. In all three games they should have been they should have been a lot better. But I, I would interestingly enough, Dick, you mentioned, you know, you could have predicted the four teams that would drop out at this stage, just as you could have predicted quite easily last year. There has been no surprise in any of the teams that has dropped out uh in in this in this current format. If you look at obviously me, they're gone, Claire are gone. You wouldn't have expected Westmead, even though they were so competitive, uh, to have dropped down either. And I would have thought Cavan too. We're, we're going to drop out, albeit they lost by a couple of goals to Russ Common. So you haven't lost anyone that you didn't expect to lose. And that format is going to change. And I think it's been well flagged that the format we see this year, I think we're looking at the last of the round robin stage. And just sorry, just to, just to keep it on Mead for a second, because we were mentioning about the, the youth of the Mead team. And obviously, when you have young players, what you need is time. And Colin O'Rourke was, was speaking after the game and he seemed to put up a, a, a case that he needs a bit of time to help rebuild Mead into a county that can challenge the game. But I think the big question mark is, will Colin O'Rourke be given the time? Do you think he's going to st- stick around, Colin? I think he'd look to stick around. He has a, well, he has his two years done and a year to review. And that review may not be, may not be great based on this year. Obviously, won a Tajin Cup next year. I think if he is to stay on, he'd have to look at making changes and certainly bolstering his coaching, his, his, his backroom team. There isn't a quick fix on this. Maybe with new management, there might be there might be some improvement, but it's not going to be the vast improvement. I think where you say me there at the bottom of Division Two, top of Division Three, that's the level that they are probably at. Colin will probably get another year, but I think he will have to make changes uh, with regard to the coaching. And just in terms of uh, changing coaches, before we finish up, I just want to touch on uh, briefly on Glenn Ryan leaving the Kildare job after uh, the first Kildare's first championship loss to Leash uh, since 2005 in the Tottenham Cup. Um, look, in fairness to Leash, they obviously came into this game. I think they wanted it more. They played better. Kildare were, were down a man for, for a significant chunk of the game. But in terms of Glenn Ryan leaving, leaving that setup. Um, I'm not quite sure how much of Kildare's problems that will actually fix. Obviously, with a change of manager, you can you you can get a a change of energy and a change of approach. But a bit like me, I think this is another case of a big Leinster county who probably have more to look at rather than just who's who's sitting on top of the pile column. I don't know what you think on that. Yeah, I think Kildare are in a believe it or not, I would say they're in a slightly better place than than me, than that they have two teams that have back to back have reached all Ireland under 20 finals. It's not everything and there's no there's no straight line on this. But I would think even 
I would think even club football is better in Kildare than it is in media. But obviously a very strong NACE team that have been to Leinster finals in recent years and we're quite close to winning it. That's a level that no Mead club is reaching or even or even getting close to. Um, so I think a new voice coming in to Kildare will lift things. I would say that they will be favourites to win Division 3 next year and to lift themselves out, whether they're back in the championship next year. Obviously, a very, very poor Tolgin Cup uh, exit to leash that that one you would not have expected you would have expected to beat them so so maybe in saying that maybe they are lower down than what I'm saying but I do think there is scope for Kildare to pick up and go and improve how much that improvement I mean you know around a little bit ahead of Mead maybe next year Cavan in around in around those those teams but I think there is improvement there for a new manager the certainly fertile ground yeah there's a few issues in I was chatting to somebody during the week that everything wouldn't be just overly harmonious in the in the back channels of Kildare between say county boards um fundraising groups and management that that's always a sort of three key stakeholders in any county that need to be pulling together and there's you know you've probably seen a, a column that was written and there's been a couple of them over the years uh, over the last year in Kildare so that that's never a good environment for for getting the best out of the players because that's the a lot of stuff feeds from that and that needs to be tidied up there's no point in putting another manager out in front if if things aren't good in the background and that's definitely from what I can see has been the case and probably one of the biggest factors um, pulling against Kildare they're pulling against themselves never mind anything else you know so they need to sort that out one way or the other because it's been a fairly pitiful fall from grace when you see where they were competing at last year could have got out of cut to more been competing at a all out of quarter final and limping out against what's the leash division four team in the Talchin Cup it's not it's, it's 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 not good enough for Kildare there's no point in seeing otherwise one thing I would couple with both Mead and Kildare but and it's a it's it's a cultural thing as much as anything else is that there is more apathy towards football in both counties that I would I would sense that that same fervent passion maybe that was there for maybe 20 and 30 years ago and that's not even and maybe even for even more recent in Kildare's uh, case that it's it's not there Kildare were able to play to comfortably accommodate their first Touching Cup game at a venue with less than a thousand people in Hawkfield or training centre that's that's where their support has gone and I certainly detected quite a bit of apathy uh, with regard to Mead as well. I don't know what the crowd was there yesterday, Dick. In, uh, it wasn't bad. It was probably yeah. about maybe seven. It was good enough atmosphere. There was you know, mostly Monaghan, so it was it wasn't a terrible crowd. I was it was more than I thought was going to come down. So yeah, no, it was it was it was okay. There was good enough atmosphere. Not too many Mead, but they did make their their voices heard towards the end. But you know, I, I agree with your point, Colm, and that's been a you know, and that that's a symptom of what's going back because like, because people on the ground know they know what's going. on on and they know whether this is a team or something that you're going to spend your money and time and effort to support and it was obvious from Kildare this year that you know things things weren't good there and that was shown with the empty empty seats in the stands as much as the, the results on the scoreboard all right. Well, look. I guess the only way is up for a few counties, and uh, over the next week, a couple of weeks, it, the All Ireland Championship is really heating up. So we're very much looking forward to the next round of knockout games. But for now, that is all for this week's Throwing Football Show. Thank you very much for tuning in and listening to us. Make sure you follow us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts, and follow all of the Irish Independence GA coverage either on in print or on the Irish Independent app. But for now, thank you very much.